Let's do that. Let's go before the Lord. Lord, we, have, we come boldly not because we're something else, because Jesus is something else, because he allows us to do this. This is a privilege that not all people realize, but we're, 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 we're exercising that privilege right now. We are exercising the privilege that Jesus Christ, your perfect son, gave us to be able to come before your throne of grace and ask for just that grace, that which we do not deserve. You know, we don't deserve to hear from you tonight, God. We are, we are, we are nothing compared to your perfection. But you have chosen to put your love upon us. You have chosen to give us your precious word in the scriptures. And so we're not left to guess. We're not left to doubt. We're not left to be scared or worried. We are left with the perfect word of God, and you've given it to us as a gift. And so, Lord, we just want to come before you now, your children. We just want to ask the Lord that you speak to us. It is your Holy Spirit that leads into all truth. So, Spirit of God, do your work in us tonight. We, all of us, and if you agree with me, I'm going to, I'm going to say it, and I want you to amen afterwards. We are giving you permission, Holy Spirit, to do a work in us tonight. Amen. amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. The Gospel. What is the gospel? Who is the gospel for? What is man's condition without the gospel? And what is man's fate without the gospel? Why do we need the gospel? The gospel is a great mystery to many. In his book to the Romans, the great apostle Paul provides clear answers to all of man's questions about God and about himself. Welcome to the HD Gospel. What do you guys think about that picture up there? Think of some light. Yeah. What do you think about that little Roman soldier helmet there, huh? You know, when you come up with a graphic, you uh, you know, you go online and you can just find all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, but just like a band, like these guys are up there singing these songs. They're good songs, right? But sometimes they sing their own original stuff. And when they sing their own original stuff, it's even better, isn't it? Yeah. I like when people sing their original stuff. So I didn't want to like grab this graphic off because we were going to go through the Book of Romans. So I wanted to come up with a, an original. So I tried. And, but that, that was what I could have. <laughs> you think we should have used it? No. Well, I, it wasn't satisfactory, so Jameson actually came out to me. She said she could be better, so she gave me <laughs> That didn't work either. Anyway, that was my attempt at humor. Okay, that was my fun. Now we're going to jump into the book of Romans. Now, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to open up a Bible. And it may be uh, one of your own, a Bible, a real Bible, a paper one. It might be on a device. That's cool. If you don't have a Bible, there's orange and yellow ones all over this church. And, and if you don't own one, you take that Bible, and you open it, you read it, and you take it home with you. It's our gift to you. Okay? Now, the pages that of uh, much of the reading that we'll do each and every week uh, will be up there on the screen, and it will be, it'll correspond with the Bibles that are here in, in the church, the yellow and orange ones. So if you want to read it, I, let, let me just say, I highly recommend it. Don't you ever just believe what I say because I have a microphone on. Is a lot of crooked people in this world, and so if what I say doesn't match with what you read, then you have the opportunity on Sunday night to come here, and we do roundtable, we can discuss it openly, whatever comes out of my mouth. And I'm open to being wrong because I'm a flawed man. My interpretation of this book is not truth. The book is truth. I'm going to try my best, okay? Now, this, this series is going to be deep. It's going to be scary at times, and I, I, I kind of got into it a little bit a couple weeks ago. We introed in, and then Kelly came, and he preached, and I just want to thank him. He's not here. Him and Wendy went on vacation, uh, but I just want to thank him because uh, awesome man of God, loves the Bible, loves you. Uh, this is a great man, and I'm thankful that he's here. And he preached an awesome, not only was it awesome, the content, but he went longer than I do, so I'm off the hook now. That was the longest service I've ever been in. I was getting uncomfortable back at Swerving, right? I was freaking out. It was like two and a half hours long on Sunday. It was awesome. It was awesome. So that allows me the privilege of going longer, and I appreciate that. Now, all kidding aside, uh, I'm not one to preach short messages because uh, I think that the Bible is like the most important thing in all the world. Like nothing can be more important. 
And so if I study all week long and God gives me some stuff to share with you, I'm going to share it. And if, you're here, if we're here for an hour, we're here for an hour and a half, listen, you, I love you. I just love Jesus more than I love you. I'm just being very honest and open with you. I love Jesus more than you. No, no, not more than you. I love Jesus more than I love you. Okay, and so I need to look into his eyes one day, and he's going to say, why didn't you? And I don't want to ever cower away from that. So I'm just going to share what I share. But look, if I get too long and you need to, to get up, I, it's okay. You, you can. There's also, just to let you know, some of you don't know yet, but out this door into the lounge, we now have this going right now live, real time, on the big screen, and it's all couches and and stuff. It's all comfortable and cozy. And so if you get into one of these wooden chairs and we're preaching for a while and you get uncomfortable, just go scurry up in the, into that room and we'll just make fun of you when you leave. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so uh, do me a favor. Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start over in verse 16. But while you're getting there, I just want to kind of remind you why we're doing this thing. Uh, I want to remind you of our, of our friend, I won't mention his name, but he's a soldier to be, and Judd and I met this kid on the street, and we talked to him about how he's going to go into the Marines, and he's going to go and he's going to swear, take an oath, to protect the Constitution of this country, and so he's willing to die, or maybe take someone's life, to protect the Constitution and the country that it represents, Amen. okay? So here's the question. Young man, have you ever read the Constitution? And he looked at me. Wait, wait, hold on a second. So, so, so you're willing to die or willing to kill someone made in the image of God to protect something you've never read? Now, now, now we all have a position on war and guns, and I'm not going to get into that. Okay, the Democrat, Republican thing here. This is Jesus out. It's not the government. So we're not going to talk about that. But we have different positions on that. Right? But here's the thing. It's life or death. Bottom line, it's life or death when you're in the service, right? Amen. You're going to protect or die. or what, Like, this is crazy. This is heavy, right? Yeah. And, and we're like that with the gospel. Yeah. Like, but, but even more so than life or death here, because we're not talking about just going into the grave. We're talking about forever. We're talking about eternal life or death. And so we have to make sure we know what the gospel is. If we're going to rely on it to actually save us for eternity, you need to know what it is. You need to understand it. It's not just, I suck, Jesus doesn't, he died, I get heaven. That's not the gospel. Now, if you melt it all down, you might hear something like that. But that is not the gospel that saves you. you got to believe some things, okay? you got to believe some things. So here we are. We're going to start... We'll do a little reading in verse uh, 16. We'll read a little bit. We'll park. We'll chew it apart. Okay, you ready? You guys all there? Yeah. All right, here we go. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jew first and also the Gentile. That means everyone. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Okay, so here, this is evidence right there. We said earlier that it's a life or death situation. He says it right here, right? This is not just Moses talking. This is the Apostle Paul. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says it's life or death. He says it is by faith that you would have life that you'd get saved. So he's talking about life, and then all of a sudden there's a big but. In the beginning of the next verse, there's a big but. Okay, so what does it mean? But God. Okay, so first of all, we, we're saved and we have life, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So if it says life, but, what does that mean? What is it telling us? Life and there's death. There's life and there's death. And, and, and to have life, you have to believe in some things. Okay, you can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm in. What if you don't know who Christ is? What if someone came up to you dressed up in a Gumby suit and said, I'm Jesus? And you put your faith in him. But his name is Jesus. <clears throat> you going to heaven? <laughs> Not going to happen, right? You need to know who the real Jesus is in order to, to, to entrust your soul to him for all eternity, okay? So you've got to believe some things for sure. Now, uh, we live in a country that is religiously tolerant, 
okay? Very religiously tolerant. Now, that may rub somebody the wrong way here. I mean, there's a lot of people in the room, so some people don't like that. They want Jesus to be president, okay? And I can, I'm tracking with you. I understand why you want Jesus to be president. He's a rocking dude. But here's the thing with that. It's like, first of all, it's not a theocracy, all right? And second of all, why would you step down from king of the universe to be the president? That's a step down. That's not a lateral move. That's like the president, like President Obama coming and running against Sheriff Borders to be to be the sheriff here. Like that would be that would be a downward move, right? So we're not gonna, Jesus is not, as much as you want to write him in, he's not gonna be your president. It's not gonna happen, okay? So but we live in a religiously tolerant country. Um, if you go online, you know there's all kinds of different things online, okay? You can't hardly find the truth. It's confusing, but the, the general consensus, if you look all over the internet, is there's about 300 known, practiced, established religions in this country. About 300 of them, okay? We'll talk about, a little bit about them later on. But there's, there's about 300 different practiced, established, recognized religions in this country. And our country is very tolerant of that. Like, you know, you see the stickers on, on, on the cars, it says coexist, and it's all the different symbols of the different religions, and, and Christians are throwing rocks at the guy's car. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> None of you do that, it's just me? I need to find another church, man. This is not working out. It's not working out. Okay? So, like, it rubs people the wrong way that there's all these different religions because a lot of people think, well, I have the right way, and you should do it this way, and this is America, and we do it this way, we're Christians. It's not the way it is. See, the religious tolerance says this. Let me put a little definition up on the, on the screen here for you. We're going to talk about tolerance because you have to understand what it really means if you're going to throw it around. Tolerance means to allow, accept, or endure without interference, even if you don't agree with it. Okay? Even if you don't agree with their religious practices, not only do you allow it, but you allow it and you let them do it peacefully and you don't mess with them while they're doing it. That, my brothers and sisters, is America. That's the country that we live in. Okay? Okay. This is the country that we live in. And I think that we all understand that. But the question I want to throw out to you is this. We are a religious, tolerant country. But is God religiously tolerant? No. Okay. We're going we're gonna to search the scriptures for that, for that answer, okay? We're going to search the scriptures for that answer, and then we'll see you tomorrow night. Okay? Now, let me offer this to you. There's a massive difference between tolerant and just. Okay? Tolerance is right now. Will you allow or accept someone to practice a different religion than you right now? We, we're Americans, but we allow that, right? Okay. So the question on the table is, does God? Well, let's talk about God's justice. God's justice in the book of Galatians tells us that we can't mock the justice of God. That what you plant, you will reap, right? What you sow, you will reap. It is a consequence. So, here's the difference. Tolerance is about here and now. Just is about the end. You connecting? So let me offer this out to you. That proper interaction with God now in the tolerance season is going to determine your interaction with God in the end season. Does that make any sense? There's a massive difference there, and you have to make a distinguishing line, and you've got to make a difference. There's a massive difference between the two, okay? Now, I said a moment ago that you have to believe in some things. And so we're going to crack right into, we're going we're gonna to take this bumpy road right now, we're going to start smoothing it out right now. Here's where it already gets deep and thick and controversial, right here, right out of the giddy up, okay? Right out of the giddy up. We're going we're gonna to see if, if, if God is religiously tolerant, but, but bear with me here. Here's the first issue that, that Paul addresses. Heaven and hell are real. It, 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 listen, there's a lot of people out there that claim that they're evangelical Christians that say that there's no real hell. Yeah. That it's just like a, a some, like, it's here, right now. 
Okay, that it's that this is hell right now. And that there's no real hell. Okay, and that there's no real heaven. Okay, but let me tell you, listen. Um, I, I don't know. I've never been to heaven. I've never been to heaven. No. I've never been to heaven. I've never been to heaven before. So I can't explain to you exactly what it's going to be like. I can't give you the zip code where it is. I can't tell you what it's going to be like. I can, I can, I can look in the scriptures and get a glimpse, maybe, and see. That's why um, I don't. I, this is just me. I have a conservative bent towards scripture. Okay. I don't believe in the ninety seconds in heaven and heaven for real stuff. Okay. I don't believe it. Okay. I'll tell you why I don't believe it. And this is this is not thus saith the Lord. But in John chapter three, it says. No one has been to heaven and come back. Okay, that's what the Bible says. Now, some, the, the Bible has two different ways to look at it. It could be descriptive, meaning it's telling us what was, or it could be prescriptive, which means it's telling you the way it's going to be. Now, I don't know which, which way to look at that, but I err on conservative. Okay, that's me. And I, when I look at the world and I see that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he never sent anyone to heaven back then and came back, why all of a sudden does he need to do it now? So this, it makes a great book, and it makes a great story, and it makes a great prophet. And I don't mean a prophet of God, I mean a prophet in the pocket, but I don't believe that it's the case. I've never been to heaven, so I can't describe it. But let me just share with you the words of Jesus Christ, because he has come from heaven, okay? So he can tell us about it. So we got to believe some stuff. Let's do, do me a favor. Go to Matthew chapter 13. And keep your finger in Romans because we're going to be there a bunch. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to see what Jesus says about this heaven and hell thing. You've got to believe that, that heaven and hell are real. Okay, They're not just here. It's not like it's bad. Like I've experienced some bad times in my life, haven't you? And I thought it was hell, but like I'm better now. So obviously it really wasn't hell, right? Because I'm not there anymore. So I, I just don't buy that. And so my experience tells me otherwise. But let's look at uh, Romans, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 36. Jesus, of course, he's always talking in parables. He's trying to explain the things of heaven in verbiage that regular guys would understand, right? That's what these parables are. So he tells this story of wheat and weed. So there's like a good plant that's of good value, and then there's the weed that we're all trying to kill with, you know, uh, Scott's lawn, you know, weed and feed, right? There's the weeds that aren't good, and then there's the, the crop that is good. And so he talks about that there's two different ones. So he tells this parable, and when he, it says here in verse 36, then leaving the crowds aside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, now, so he, he's just with this small group. That's a plug for Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Jesus was in a small group. And we're supposed to be Christ-like. Okay. Um, it, it says here, his, uh, his disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. So let me read it to you. Read it verse 37. Jesus replied, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. Okay, try to identify who you are here, guys. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. Evil one, devil, same person. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom Everything that causes sin and all who do evil and the angels, this is the scary part, will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine, the true Christians, will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Now here's the, here it is. Here's the plea. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, so like, like I said, I've had some rough times that seemed like hell, right? Anyone? Okay. When you were there, were there gnashing of teeth? Like, like torment nonstop. I cry. Sometimes when I'm sad, I cry. You guys cry? I cry all the time, right? But listen, when I was sad, when things weren't going well, like I'll cry, but 
This is talking about weeping, like, ah! you know, like, non-stop, like, you ever see a baby? <laughs> and they can't control, <laughs> they can't control themselves, like, that's what we're talking like, non-stop, right? In the fiery furnace to burn. I've never had that happen. Anyone else? <laughs> no one's had that happen. I did. Yeah, I did. Frank did. Now listen, listen, I want to go on. He says, anyone with hear, ears to hear, listen, listen, like he's pleading with you. Not only listen, but understand what I'm trying to tell you here, right? Now jump down to um, verse 47. Very similar, except instead of using uh, the farm and the farmer and the plants, some of us are fishermen. Who's a fisherman here, right? Got a couple of fishermen. These two guys, one back there, right? It's Lake County. What's wrong with these people? Yeah. Yeah. So like three of them in this room. Uh, Bunch of freaks, huh? Okay, so here in verse 47, similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. All kinds of people get caught in the net, right? Well, when the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. This is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things? He's pleading with the, with the person that's listening, with his audience, which is now you. He's pleading with you to understand that hell is real. Okay? It's a place. It's a, it's a condition that you will be in, okay? That's, that's what happens to those that are not Christians. Like, it's real. We're talking about hell and never laugh. It's awesome. If I fly over, that would be hell right here. Okay, he heaven and hell is real. Now, listen, narrow is the path, and few are finding it, and so Jesus is pleading with his people, please understand what I'm telling you, that your end is bad if you do not embrace me as Lord and Savior. If you're not a real Christ follower, your end is weeping, gnashing of teeth, and a fiery hell. Like, that's real. Please, he's saying, please understand what I'm telling you. I'm not talking about fishing, and I'm not talking about farming. I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about Forever, the Bible talks about Hades, Sheol, Hell, Tartarus, the Lake of Fire. It is real. It is real. It is real. Okay, this right here, this is not hell. Like sometimes it's bad. Would you agree? But it's nowhere in comparison to what it's going to be if you do not accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, you have to understand that it's real. Now, listen. Not only is it really bad, it was weeping and gnashing of teeth and a fiery furnace. It's really hot and uncomfortable, but listen to this. Jesus, again, in Matthew 25, 46, he's talking about that his, the lovers of Jesus, the followers of Jesus, the ones that he imputed his righteousness to, like you came to the cross and you offered him death and he gave you life, so he gave you his life. He imputed it upon you, and it says that those people that have been imputed by righteousness will go into eternal life. But, is that word again? But the others will go away into eternal punishment. Now you notice that the verbiage is very, very similar. But make no mistake, it's not identical. It's not identical. The believers, the true followers of Christ, will go into eternal life. But those that are not will go away. Is that word? Away into eternal punishment. But notice that word too. That's what I want you to understand. Eternal. See. Heaven is real. Hell is real. It's forever. So we're talking about life or death here, right? Eternal life or death. It's of the utmost importance that we get this. Remember, that's why Paul is writing this letter to Jews, to Gentiles, all these different belief systems, and he's roping them all in. So there's one gospel, there's one Jesus, there's one way to be saved, there's one heaven, there's one God. And that's what he's trying to accomplish here. He's trying to accomplish that in us too. Now he says that they will be, they will go into eternal life, and the others will go away into eternal punishment. Now, what does that mean? Let me clarify. In the book of Revelation, everyone say, ooh, ooh, and Revelation. The Bible says that in glory, when we're there in heaven with him, that we will actually be with God. That God will be with his people. He will be 
with you like I am here right now. Not in the spirit, living in your chest cavity, or floating around here, kind of leading people and influencing people, but face to face. God will be, hey man, what's up? Hey baby. <laughs> God will be face to face. You will be in his presence. As a matter of fact, it says you don't need lamps. Because God himself will be the light. Like, you won't need a light there. You will be face to face with the Lord Jesus in person right here. Okay, That's what it says heaven is like. But So we go away into, we, we, I'm sorry, we go into eternal life, into the presence of God. But it says here that those that are not the others will go away into eternal punishment. So, you guys are smart, right? So if going to eternal life is in the presence of God, like the very presence, personal, real, what does going away mean? A place where he is what? Not, right? A place where God is not. And that is eternal. It's forever. It is forever, okay? Now, who's going away? Who is it that's going away? Is it those, is it those non misbehaviors? Those heathens? Mm -hmm. Ones who are out there smoking? Let's get Hey, now. It's where the naughty ones. Ones we don't like. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> well, it's very, very clear who it's going to be. Verse 18 of Romans 1, what does it say? It says, those who suppress the truth in their wickedness. Uh -huh. That's who's going away to a place where God is not, where it's hot and weeping oh. and gnashing of teeth forever. Oh. It's those who suppress the truth in their wickedness. So here's some good news. You ready? Here's the good news. Here's why you decided to come to Revolution Church tonight. You're all wicked. Every one of you is wicked. I'm wicked. You're wicked. You're wicked. She's wicked more because she's yawning while I'm preaching. Every one of us is wicked. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that not a single one of us is righteous. Not a single one of us is pursuing God. That every single one of us sins and falls short of the glory of God. And the book of Jeremiah, he tells us this prophet of God, thus saith the Lord, that the heart is desperately wicked. 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 Right? Not just Joseph's heart. Not just Mary. No, he's not, he's not isolating. Well, I'm a, I'm a Frank, Frank is like, I'm not wicked. Right? See, so that's where we are, right? Oh, yeah, her, Jessica's heart. Oh, oh, oh. She's wicked, but not Mary. Right? No, 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 no. no. It doesn't say what hearts. It says what? The human heart. Who's a human here? Some of you need to raise your hand. That's awesome. That is so awesome. It's a personal suppression. It's a personal wickedness. Like everyone is wicked. So, so if everyone is wicked, does that mean everyone's going away? No. Oh, there's got to be more there. It's not just behavior modification, right? That's not Christianity. There's something more to it, okay? There's something more to it. Everybody does bad. Everybody does wrong. So that would mean that everyone would go to hell. That's not the case. It says here that those that suppress the truth in their way. So, so, so you can, you can, look, at, you can do wrong, but that doesn't mean that you don't know the truth. First John 1, 9 is one of my favorite verses. Y'all, you need to memorize this one. You need to memorize this one. Like, you need to write it down. If you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all the unrighteousness. Every Christian should be exercised. I know I need to. Right? So you can do wicked, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily suppressing the truth. You're not holding it down where no one can see it, that you don't live it. Like, it's those people. It's the ones that, that cover the truth, that press it down so nobody can see it, that won't be there. Not the ones that are flawless. There's no such person. Now, now why, why, are we talking, why am I telling you that you're all wicked? Okay? Um, do me a favor. Look here in verse 19 and 20 of, of the text that we already uh, took a look at. See, it says that those who suppress the truth in their wickedness, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse.
excuse for not knowing God. We, at, look, at, listen, I, I don't know about people that are blind, like, let's not, like, put me in a corner and go, how about the guy who lives in a cave in Uganda and he's blind, deaf, and can't speak, and he has no parents? Like, I don't want, let's not talk about that guy. Okay, let's talk about the, the masses. Okay, most of us, I think, here can see, right? Most of us can hear stuff, right? Most of us can feel things. Okay, so what it's saying here is that every person on earth, they've seen the beauty, they've seen his strength, they've seen God's creative awesomeness out there. You've, you've seen babies, and you've seen lions, and you've seen mountains, and you've seen sunsets, and you've seen the ocean, and you've seen the stars blanket over you. Like, everyone has seen that there's an amazing, amazing creator so no one is with an excuse. You can't say, well, nobody told me fiddlesticks. That's a Christian cuss. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Guts. You, you can't say that I, oh man, I didn't know. I, I just didn't know that there was, I, no one can claim ignorance. Right, you just gotta look and you see amazingness all around you, and you know something's going on. So nobody can claim ignorance. No one, it says. Okay, here's the thing. There's another but coming, okay? This is a huge but. Okay, but this is what happens. <laughs> it's one T. It's one T for all you YouTube people. One T in this church. <laughs> At least this week. Um, well, we're getting there. There's a little bit more in that chapter. Trust me, we might get there. Um, what people do with this is, is they see all this. They see what's going on, right? But then they exalt themselves as the highest authority on earth to interpret that which they see. They, make the, they exalt themselves as the highest authority. They see all this evidence. And they go, okay, I'm going to decide what all this is, and how it was made, and how it works, and how we're to interact with it. I decide. You guys know Jared? Who knows Jared here? I know. Okay, so, so, so you know his name is Jared, right? He's got a wife, Candy, right? He's a father of two kids, Serenity, and y'all know me, right? Everyone knows me, right? So is, would you agree that that's who he is? Okay, but this is what people do. No, he's not. No. He's Tom. He's single. And he likes to skateboard. <laughs> That's what he does. No, don't say no to me. I decide what you are. You see? That's what people do. See, God's, God's made himself known out there. And then he gives us his most accurate... Uh, Evidence is, is overwhelming at the accuracy of thousands of years of truth, and we throw it out the window and make up our own stuff about who God is and how He made it, what He does, and how we interact with Him properly. We decide that's not Jared, and don't you dare tell me that I can't tell him that he's Tom. I think he's Tom, so you're Tom. And I think you're single and you skateboard a lot too much. But I'm Jared. No, you're not Jared. You're talking. And that's exactly what we do with God. All of us. Look at verse 21 and 23. Yes, they know God. I'm going to go over some of the same verses over and over again. Beat it into your head. And you beat it into mine and beat it into yours. 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. You see, what you see the illustration now? As a result, their minds became dark and confused. It's like a death spiral. Once you get out of this book and start adding your own stuff in, you're done. You start, and then your mind gets dark and confused, and then downhill you go from there. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like, and I love the word that's used here, mere 
people, birds, animals, and red light. Like, 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 not even second class. We're talking bottom of the of the ladder here, man. You're making, you're worshiping things. Like you, you, you go out and you chop down a tree and you use half of the wood to cook your steak and then you carve the rest of it into an idol and then you worship it? What's wrong with you people? But that's what we do. Right? Why would you do that? You chop down the tree to use it to make an outhouse to poop in and the other wood you use to <coughs> worship. That's what people do. It's funny, but it's true, right? Tell me I'm wrong. We've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. People do it all the time. So this is what people do. They know about God. And he's, 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 he's outlined all this truth about who he is in the scriptures. And we throw the book out and we go, we're going to make up our own thing. So we come up with all these wacky religions and how to interpret all that we see. And try to make sense of it all. You know why? To please us. I got a great, I looked up some wacky religions. You can Let me look it up on my phone here. Hold on a second. I got it. Um, Top 10 crazy religions, number one was Scientology. I mean, number 10. Like, you guys realize that was, that was started on a, like, a, a, a fictional book? <laughs> a science fiction? Like, it's a religion, right? It's crazy. Yeah, number 100. Um, there's the creativity movement. There's, I can't spell that one. I said, there's the nation of Yahweh. And there, um, the Son of God to them is Yahweh ben Yahweh. That's his name. Um, the Church of All Worlds. This guy, just a picture of him makes me freaked out. Um, his name is Oberon Zell Ravenheart, and his wife, Glory Zell Ravenheart. I couldn't even go to that church, just because of the names. Um, the universe people, let's get a little spook here. The universe people, the cosmic people of light. Uh, that's a good one. Um, this one's a crazy uh, one. Let me, let, me give you the, let me give you the one I want. This is the Church of Euthanasia. You guys have heard of that one? I think we're running out of natural resources, so what we do is do not have children anymore. Because you're gonna suck up all the oil. So save the there's the picture of the founder, and she's got a sign, save the planet, kill yourself. Awesome. That's gonna really back him in. Right? It's gonna back him in. Okay, here's the one I want you to get. It's Nuwabianism. N-U-W-A-U-B-I-A-N-I-S-M. Nuwabianism. And and this is no joke. They built a compound on like 50 acres with Egyptian pyramid. I mean, like, this was Mad Daddy. It went into foreclosure. The government took it and bulldozed it because it's that crazy. The government sometimes is smart. Nuwambi is, let me read a little bit here. This is crazy. Is an umbrella term used to refer to the doctrines and teachings of the followers of Dwight York. The Nuwambians originated as a black Muslim group in New York City in the 70s and have gone through many changes since. Eventually, the group established a headquarters in Putnam County, Georgia, where they built that in 1993, which they have since abandoned. York is now in prison after having been convicted on money laundering and child molestation charges, but Nuwambianism endures. Uh, York developed Nuwambianism by drawing on a wide range of sources, which include, and I'll just, it's just a bunch of different, so he's, he's making up, his, he's a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that, he's putting it all together to create his own thing. Now here's, Here's a list of some of the more unusual Nuwabian beliefs. Feel free to laugh. <laughs> Number one, it's important to bury the afterbirth so that Satan does not use it to make a duplicate of the recently born child. <laughs> I'm not, listen, it's on here. Okay. Two, furthermore, some aborted fet fetuses survive their abortion to live in the sewers where they are being gathered and organized to take over the world. What? I think that's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Yeah. If that's where it came from, then that's where it came from. Three, people were once perfectly symmetrical and, and ambidextrous, but then a meteorite struck Earth and tilted its axis, causing handedness and shifting the heart off center in the chest. Uh, number four, each of us has seven clones living in different parts of the world. Okay. Uh, five, women existed for many generations before they invented men. <laughs> what woman in this place would invent a man? Right, exactly. Okay, right. Right, exactly. Throw the whole religion out of the window. Listen, listen. Uh, they invented men through genetic manipulation. The manipulating part I buy. I buy that. Um, 
Okay, six. Homo sapiens is the result of cloning experiments that were done on Mars using Homo erectus. Nikola, Nikola Tesla, who's the, one of the originators, one of the prophets, came from the planet Venus. This is, it, this is awesome right here. The Illuminati have nurtured a child, Satan's son, who was born on June 6, 1966, at the Dakota House on 72nd Street in New York, to Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis of the, of the Kennedy families. The Pope was present at the birth and performed, performed necromantic ceremonies. The child was raised by former U.S. President Richard Nixon and now lives in Belgium where it is hooked up bodily to a computer called the Beast 3M. Awesome! Awesome! This, listen, but this is what people do. They, they, they walk outside and they see like amazing, like the Ozarks and the, and the Rocky Mountains and babies and rainbows and sunsets and all this amazing stuff. And this, that's what they come up with. This, this is what they come up with. Let me ask you a question. How many people in here have ever made a choice that caused them harm or it failed, right? How many people in here also would do something that they knew was wrong, but they do it if they thought maybe they could get away with it? Come on, be honest. So why would you trust yourself to make any choice? Why would you ever trust the way you think? We're all broken people, right? And so God in his grace provides this. And people have died, they've been impaled and crucified and dumped within oil and murdered, beheaded, all so that you would know who he really is. And that's why we study the book of Romans, so we would know who he really is. It's amazing because I think just takes over. Yeah. Suppress the truth and I think wickedness. Wow. Let's just say that. You know, I said that, I mentioned earlier about the tent over the building. Yeah. So I came up here the other day so that they could put the tent up and I met the owner of the tent company. Super nice guy, right? And, and so he, we start talking. We start talking, you know, and he, he, he knew that I was a pastor of the church, so we, we start talking. Oh God, you know, go figure. And so he says, well, I grew up Catholic. And he starts to just outline his whole life oh and what he believes and what he doesn't believe and what he went, went to, to church and dance and his first communion stuff and all this kind of Catholic stuff. And, and so I'm just sitting there listening to him, right? And it was cool. He was a nice guy. And, and so all of a sudden I, had, I found the crack. I had an opportunity to say something. And so I said, you know, my mom is sort of... Um, like you, in that she believes some things, and so what I offered her is, I said, you know, why don't you just read your Bible, and then you can make a quality choice on whatever you read. That's fine, you know. And of course, my mom won't do that, but this guy, he was probably 60, grew up in America, went to church, and I said, I, I offered it to him this, read your Bible, and then make a choice, and he said to me, pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. No, I'm not kidding you. Like, I, it's cool. He's a really nice guy. But he's like, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. Like, so that they will make up stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, actually read the Bible. Like, that was a novel idea. So, he, and, he, and, I'm, and he's a good dude, right? But he's suppressing the truth in his own wickedness. Like, he, he, he doesn't know. He's never even read God's word. He wouldn't know. Okay? Let me, this is what we do. We make up some stuff. Here's some normal ones. We have this like hyper strict God where it's like you have to have God, but you have to have this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule. You gotta do this this way to be accepted by God. That's the hyper strict God. And then all the way down here is the hyper grace God that says, hey, you know what? I believe the whole Jesus thing. I believe it went to the cross. I believe that all my sins are forgiven, so I can just do whatever I want. He knows my heart. Well, the Bible here in Romans, chapter after chapter after chapter, saying no to the hyper-strict law of God. And then in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul's like, yeah, no, you can't do that. You can't just say, oh, I, I, I'm forgiven of all things, so I can just keep doing whatever I want. Because, right, the greater the sin, the greater the forgiveness, the greater the glory, right? Awesome. God gave him, you know what, it said, like, more forgiveness, more God. That theory work? Paul's like, of course not, exclamation point. 
That's what we do. And then there's those that aren't even trying to worship the real God. They blatant disregard for him, and they worship idols, like man-made granite and stone and, and wood like I talked about. That's what we do. And, and no one is with excuse. Everyone knows that there's a God. How are we going to interpret him? So I get back to this question I asked earlier about, is God a religiously tolerant God? No. If, if, you, if you won't worship him the right way, my position, hear me out, okay? My position is absolutely you can do what you will. Absolutely you can do what you will. And I won't make you do anything. I will not make you. You see, this is where, and I'm not going to get into it today, but this is where we get the whole Calvinist and Arminius argument. And I'm going to tell you right now, that I read the scripture, and, and my belief system, this is just me, okay? You're all accountable for your own choices. Everyone has a Bible that's available for them, so no one is with excuse. I don't see God making people do things, okay? I don't see it. I don't see him make, if he wants everyone to say, why would he make someone purposely not to believe in him? Now, I'm getting this from this text right here. Look at verse 24. They're misbehaving, right? They're not worshiping him, right? And what does he say? Verse 24, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. Verse 26, similar verbiage. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Verse 28, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be. Done. God is religiously tolerant. He will let you do what you want. Now remember, there's a massive difference between tolerant and just. Tolerance says, you can do it if you want, but just know my justice says it's consequences in the end. You can do as you please, but you're, not, you're going to have to there's going to be results. You know, he doesn't make you do so. Sometimes he comes in like a freight train and he clobbers you, yeah. right? You guys know who Mark Gastineau is? Yeah. Anyone know who Mark Gastineau is? Yeah. New, York Stock, New York Stock Exchange, right? Mark Gastineau, Joe Klecko, New York Jets in the 80s. This guy played. Wild man. He'd come off the line like a bullet. He was insane. Watch this guy, right? The clock to 30 seconds. Great round. Sometimes this is what Jesus does to you. Watch this guy. Watch him come. gone 
like some of us do, and got out of their house and sat there blind and ticked off at God and said, why would you do this to me to help with you? Could have, right? People do it all the time. But he didn't. Why? He chose. He chose. He chose. And that's exactly what God does here. He lets you choose. And that rubs the righteous wrong. Because there's many of us that are Christians that love the Lord and their behavior has shifted so much. And so when you see someone else who's allowed to be rotten and they don't pay, it ticks us off. Go get them, God. Give them what they deserve. Right? Yeah. 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 And God's like, no. Oh, I'll let them do it. See, because you're a rotten God. If you were to in charge, this world would be a mess. Right? Can't even run our own house. Right? <laughs> I was about to get so bad that Cindy would come swing right in. I'm just going to leave him alone. I'm just going to leave him alone, right? But here's the thing. Sometimes justice comes quick, right? You sin, and boom, you're punished immediately, right? And, 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 and Christians, we like that kind of justice, right? Oh, they got what they deserve. Right? Yeah. But see, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it's, it's allowed. It's allowed, but it's painful in the future. Sometimes in ways you don't even see. See, we all think, well, that rich, dishonest guy, he's making all this money, he's got a nice house, he's got a Lexus, boom, and I'm working while you know what, I'm making a little piece of crap. And you think he's getting away with something. But you don't know of his loneliness. And you don't know of his shame that he's carrying around with him because he's used people to get to where he is. And it makes him feel rotten. So you don't know it. He's got a mask over it called Lexus. And we all see the Lexus, but we don't know what he's carrying. You know what I'm saying? We don't see what he's carrying. And outside of the cleansing blood of Jesus, that person may be miserable. He, he may not have quality relationships. You know why? Because no one really loves the rich guy. They love what the rich guy can do for them, Right? As soon as the guy doesn't have any more money, they don't call you anymore. Right? right. Yeah. It happens all the time. So we don't know that just because this guy's loaded, he's got a big house the size of this building, that he's happy. Or he has good, meaningful relationships. Or if he even has a purpose to get up in the morning other than to make a paycheck. That would, I'm sorry, that would suck if that was the, the entirety of your life, to get up and make more money. Like, that would be awful. And, and so many of us are living that way. So we might have total torment inside of us because we're rich and dishonest, but the Christian, we don't see it. We don't see the, we want to see quick punishment visible for the guy who's being unchristlike. We want to see it. And God's like, no, I'll let that fly. Get you in the end. <laughs> we'll get you. But I'll let it fly. I'll let it fly. So, so why, why are we, why, why, that's why we're studying Romans. Why? why, why, why? Because we, need to, we don't want to suppress the truth. Right? You want to know the truth. You want to know who God really is. And so, the Absolute Authority series, that taught us of, of what God does. But Romans, you know what it does? It teaches us who God is. You know what I'm saying? It teaches us his character, how he operates, how he thinks, what he feels. We need to know that. Remember it says that your faith, it's all by faith, and it starts and finishes by believing some things. Right? We've got to know who God is. And that's why we study the book of Romans. Paul, the guy who wrote this, he had this young protege, Timothy. And, and the same thing, remember he's trying to rope this thing in, rope it all in, right? All across the known world that all these different belief systems kind of coming together. They're trying to do the Jesus thing, but you got Judaism here, and you got this there, and they're trying to come in, and Paul's trying to get it all roped in to understand. One gospel, one Jesus, one God, one salvation, one heaven, one church, one flock with one shepherd. Okay, and so he tells Timothy... In 2 Timothy chapter 4, go there with me. I should have told you in advance, I'm not going to be short. Did I? Let me tell you again. Remember Al Pacino? He said to the woman, I'm just getting walled up. 
Okay, look. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says this. He says this to his young preacher, student. He says, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct. You see this? That's what Paul's doing. And he's telling his student preacher to do the same thing. Correct them. Corral them. Get them back in line with who God really is. Okay? He says, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires. Sound familiar? And will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. So they want to do what they want. They want people to tell them it's okay to do it. I just want a news flash. You ain't going to get that here. I want to see people walking out of here just like, sorry. This is the way I did it. And now you're telling me. Yeah. I read it. If you got a problem, take it up with Almighty. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and music teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Truth, 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 truth. That is why we're studying through the book of Romans. That you might know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what the truth does. Now, this, this section of scripture in 2 Timothy, most conservative evangelical Christians use this to defend against the prosperity gospel of you send us 50 bucks and you'll be blessed, right? Who's the guy getting blessed now? We gotta get the 50 bucks, right? Don't buy into that. Don't buy into that. No, 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 no Christian is promised wealth and health and prosperity and position and, 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 and like influence, like you, maybe, maybe influence. <laughs> maybe influence. You're not promised those things. Matter of fact, most of the Christians in this book, like, killed, beheaded, dipped in oil, burning hot oil, right? Impaled. And I'm not talking about little, uh, the little snowman in Frozen. <laughs> Okay, all of us 
We're made by God in His image, but some of us say, well, I was made that way, and so therefore, I can do that. But here's the problem with that. I believe, and this is me, I believe it's just us defending our own desires. See, like I said earlier, we, we see what God has done, and we make up our own religious system and try to evaluate that thing, right? And we do the same with sexuality. We say, well, I was made this way, so therefore I can do it. I believe that that's just me defending my desires. Because the Bible says that God made human beings in, in, both in man and female. So male and female, right? To be joined together as one flesh so they could be fruitful and multiply. And the Bible says, tells us in Colossians 1.16 that all things were created for him. So how does this whole for him unravel? How do you, how do you unpack all that? Well, man and woman come together as one flesh and they are fruitful and they multiply so that more people would come to know him and worship him. That's what it's all about. Okay, and that is a social mandate. That's what we were told to do. And that doesn't happen if we all go our own way and say, well, I just like dudes. Okay, the, there's no fruitful multiplication here. Do, do you catch me? There's no fruitful multiplication right here. So it doesn't matter if you feel like it or you think he made you that way. He's not working against himself. A house divided is easily conquered. That's what he said. God says that. So why would he say that and then purposely do something to fight against his own way? It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, what does he say about this sexuality that's a little bit different? Let's see what he says about it. Verse 26 and 27, he uses words like shameful, vile, degrading, unnatural, and abnormal. And he's talking about this. They did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the things God created himself. And instead, the creator himself who was worthy of eternal praise. This is what they did. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. So, so and then it goes on and says that the men, instead of having normal sex relations with women, burned with lust for each other, men did change the things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserve. You see, if you don't do it the way God said to do it, that's why he calls it vile, degrading, unnatural, and abnormal. So we can't say, well, God made me this way. Why would he make you that way and purposely form you in your mother's womb to break his own word? Does that make any sense? I don't get that. But here, listen. Look at the men that they, they burned with lust for one another, right? Like, like... I'm not that guy. I'm just going to go on record, okay? I'm, I'm not that guy. But, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting, you know, and I'll tell you what, Dwayne is no shorts. Buddy. See, I'm not doing that. But see, look at it. I'm, I'm just joking around, right? But some of them here might. They might think he looks great. Some dude might think he looks great. But see what it says? It says they burned lost, but then they did it. They acted upon it. See, they acted upon this thing. How many people have sinned? Could you have not? Did I make my point? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 10 23 says, I am allowed to do anything, but not all things are helpful or beneficial. You see, I said earlier that God is religiously tolerant, He'll let you go make up your own religion. You can look at all that he has made that he's very happy with. He sat back and said, this is very good, right? He can, you, can, you can look at all that and you can, you can spin his face and itself and say, you know what, it is awesome. Instead of responding properly to that awesomeness the way you've told me to, I'm going to make up my own thing. He'll let you, just like this. He'll let you go live this type of vile, degrading, unnatural, abnormal lifestyle. But he's just 
but he's tolerant. He'll let you do it. It says that he abandoned them to do whatever their shameful hearts desire. If you want it, have at it. Do it. Do it all you want. I hear it all the time. I was made this way, so I should be able to do it. God made marijuana, so you can smoke it. Who's heard that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that bleach is predominantly made of a derivative of salt called sodium hypochlorite? It's naturally occurring. Why don't you go drink some bleach? <laughs> Why don't you? Huh? Why don't you do that? How many people like frog legs here? It's the South. Who likes frog legs? Raise your hand. You're all sick in the head. Okay? I'll tell you one thing, that won't be in heaven. You're a lie. You're a lie. Yeah, frog legs, right? You think frog legs are yummy, right? Because God, God made them, you deep fry them. Mmm, bon appetit, you sick freaks, right? That, you like this, right? It's disgusting. Why don't you eat the frog right up here? Show them that. Why don't you eat those frog legs? Oh, because that frog is poisonous, so you can do all things, but not all things are beneficial then, right? Oh, you can smoke a pot that kills your brain cells and distorts your ability to, to do normal things. You can maybe kill somebody because you don't know what you're doing because you're so high, you run some kid over, right? But that's okay. God made it. It's natural. Yeah, sure, smoke it up. I can do it. You know, car batteries are made of sulfuric acid and water. Do you know that when a volcano explodes, that it releases in this gas sulfur trioxide, which dissolves in rainwater to form sulfuric acid. It's naturally occurring. How about we go on after the service and have a, a car battery drinking contest? No. Who's in? No. I hear you ain't going to drink more than me. Why not? It's natural. God made it. Let's drink some car battery acid. What's wrong with you people? Sexually, God made us male and female to be joined together sexually as one flesh and to stay connected until death. And in this divine plan, the species continues and worship is achieved and anything outside of that plan is not worshiping him as God. It's doing your own thing because you think that, because I think Ken is good looking and it makes me happy, so I'm going to get with him. And it doesn't matter what God said about male and female, I like him. So that's all that matters. So I exalt myself as the authority on how this whole world and how this whole universe that I didn't make is supposed to run. That's the way it works. Some dudes do find other dudes a little bit more attractive than maybe that I would. And some girls might find other girls a little bit more attractive than some girls find those, those same girls. I, I understand. Like there's seven billion people on this earth. And we're all a little bit different. Some guys like blondes. Some guys like brunettes. Some guys like tall. Some guys like short. Some guys look at guys. And like, Listen, that doesn't even have to do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Just because you feel that you want to do it, that doesn't mean you should. All things are allowed, but not all things are beneficial. Have you ever seen Jimmy's Jeep? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like his Jeep. It's lifted. It's green. It's a bad truck, man. Y'all see my car, right? <laughs> what do you guys laugh about? I was just saying to Jimmy, we want my car. Like I, I honestly, I'd like to have your Jeep. I would. I would. I mean, I would like to have this Jeep, right? So, I, listen. I feel like I like his Jeep, so I should just go take it. Yeah. Well, why not? <coughs> why, 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 who are you to tell me what to do? Your elder. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, right? So it doesn't matter what we feel like we want to do, because when God says not to, you say, yes, sir. That's what you do. Just because you feel attracted, because if I felt attracted to Jeff, it doesn't mean I have to act on it, right? I can, I can say no to that. Like, just as much as I can say no to 
going and jacking his car right now. Like, I, I have a choice to make. So maybe you do. I'm not, listen, I'm not discounting 7 billion people having different wiring. I'm not discounting the fact that maybe some guys find some of the guys a little attractive. I'm not saying that that's not the case. But we are, we are made male and female. It's not up to us to decide, well, you know what? I know I have a penis, but I feel like I'm a woman. No, you're not a woman. Meredith's sister thinks she's a man. Can you do it with a I said this. I said, can you do it with a vagina? She said, yes, I said, you're a woman now. Bottom line, God made you male and female. It's not up to us to exalt ourselves to the highest authority to look at creation and say, this is what I think it should be, and I don't care what you say, I'm in charge. That's idolatry, and you are at the center of the universe, not Almighty God. Not Almighty God. In Eden, God made everything perfect. Man and woman. Everything's working perfect. But after sin invades our world, everything gets jacked up. And God's perfect original plan is ruined. It's just trashed on all fronts. Sexuality twisted. That's where it came from. This is not God's plan. He made them male and female to come together as one flesh to procreate and create more worshipers of him. That's, right. That's all we're here for, yo. That's what we're here for. And so when sin enters the world, it jacks up all of creation. So that's when false sexuality invades our world and greed and selfishness and all ungodly actions and thoughts and motives enter into humanity. And in chapter 5 of Romans, it teaches us that we all get a piece of this DNA passed on to us all. It's inevitable. We all get it. The predominant issue for all of mankind is that since the fall, man and God have a work relationship. It's just off. Remember the meteorite that the Nuwamians said came and knocked us off, killed her a little bit? That's what sin did to Holy us and God. That was the meteorite that Holy messed things up. And so therefore, all, worship, all of us worship incorrectly by exalting ourselves, by creating our own religious system that we think we can figure out God. We can look at it all and go, this is the way it's going to be. And I said so. We do this by living in a, in a I think way. We think that what we do is good and right, but this I think mentality, God said, listen, you can do an I think, but your I think mentality has to, you know, about me and toward me has to be the way I've outlined it to be. That's it. You have to do it my way. And no one is exempt from this. If you have eyes to see you know. And he has given us his word so we would know. Now he'll let you do what you want. And again, I close with this. He is just. And no one ever will get away with anything. You cannot mock the justice of God. His eyes go back and forth across the earth. There's nowhere that you can run that he cannot find you. He knows exactly what you're doing. He is tolerant of any other way. But if you want a happily ever after ending, you've got to do it his way. And that's why we're studying the H.D. Gospel. We're going to focus close to a year in this book so that you'll know the truth. So you can really honestly follow the real know who God is. Uh, my desire, and then we're going to take communion together, my desire is that everyone who goes to this church, who calls Revolution Church their home, that someone can come up to them and say, share the gospel with me. And if you think they won't ask you to pray for you, will. But you can sit down and elaborate what that book says Amen. about God and that person who will come to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for letting us gather here tonight. 
I thank you for such an awesome group of people that allows me to teach the truth. And they don't shame me. They don't shun me. They give me the freedom to be able to do this. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the word of God that is so incredibly precious and valuable. I thank you, Lord, that you have you, you've given it to us. Like, that is an insane gift to be able to know who you are. So we don't have to walk outside and guess. What an amazing, amazing privilege it is to have your very word in our hand. Even like on our cell phone, in our hand, a free app. How crazy is that? Lord, I, I guess at this point I would just ask as we venture off down this journey into the book of Romans that you would help us now uh, as we start to just... Just get rid of all preconceived notions, all this, this, these ideas of what we think you are, or, you know, what we think the creation is, or what we think we should do. Like, just, just trash all that, Lord. Just trash it all. And begin to build into us a true understanding of who you really are. Help us to be a church that is a disciple-making church. Disciples that make disciples. Help us to be a church. I'm going to go out on a limb here, guys. I want you to join me in this. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. That God is good. That God is powerful. That God is great. And that he loves this church. And not only does he want us to be a church of disciples making disciples, but that we would be a church that, that plants churches. Help us to be that type of church, Lord, that knows the truth and sends it forth across the earth. That is my desire. I dream big, Lord. You put it inside of me. And I just pray that you do that same to all of us here. Help us dream big. Help us bring the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news that's the power of God that saves people. It tells us how we're to be right in God's sight. Not of our own accord, not of our rule keeping, not of so much grace that we can do whatever we want, but true, honest to goodness, biblical faith in the name of Jesus. Help us with that. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Does everybody understand why you take communion? Everybody understands. Because I think sometimes we take it for granted. What we truly are doing when we take the bread. When we take the blood. The wine. Communion, also known as the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, is one of two sacraments given by Jesus to the church. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, they broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, eat this, it is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it. All of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when the drink is new with you in my Father's kingdom. Another one is here. Why is practicing communion important? As a Christian takes communion, they are making a proclamation that they believe in Jesus as their Savior and has trusted in his sacrificial death for the forgiveness of their sins. That's how it works. The act of taking communion does not save a person, but rather demonstrates a person's personal faith and shows that they have already been given salvation in Jesus. As such, communion is to be done regularly as a worship act celebrating Jesus. Jesus is said, Jesus said it is important for Christians to practice communion as a way to remember Him and His sacrificial life. say that you don't have to or there are some that say that you have to have had first communion and be baptized in order to take the bread and drink the blood. I don't think Jesus said that. <laughs> Anyone can do as long as you believe in Jesus Christ and that he went to the cross, to the cross to die for our sins. There's a reason too why we like to take it together because as what Jesus did with his disciples, he took the bread together with them and said, This is my body. Take this in my Because he lives. 